colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and pleasure indeed to be invited. And I thank uh, uh, Professor Jörv and Ulo for uh, this invitation. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's also feels very good to honor Victor in this way, who has um, given me so much work to do, <laughs> you could say, and so many other people work to do. And uh, therefore, he is uh, really unique, I must say. Now, um, what I really thank you for is to remind me about the fact that Victor would have become 100 years last year. Uh, to be honest, I had not remembered that. And I think that hardly anyone in Stockholm brought that up. So it was uh, uh, Jörg's and Ulo's initiative that brought this to my mind. And Tamas was around and he said, Thomas, we have to do something about this in Stockholm. <laughs> and, and as you see, now we have done something. So we have an organizing committee with Birgitta Agerbert, who was closely working in Victor's group for many years. And Thomas Batfai, of course. And um, Hans Jönvall, who is a senior uh, chem biochemist since many, many years. Uh, he was, had his own group but uh, he worked uh, with Victor. And then we have two young people, Pet Bergman, who is a student of uh, Birgitta Agerbert, and Christian Broberger, who is my student. So as you can see here, it will be September 26, 27. And um, uh, if you're interested in uh, coming, you, you may uh, uh, send me a mail. You have the mail address there, or to Catherine, a travel team. Uh, we, we will make a list and, and uh, give personal invitations, but we can unfortunately not give any financial support for, for the travel. But I think it will be a very exciting event. We have invited 16 outstanding uh, scientists who all worked, all, most of them worked with Victor's peptides. So we will get an up to date what is happening in, with Victor's peptides at that occasion. Now, um, there are many peptides, as we heard. Victor has discovered quite a lot of them. Uh, I, I have um, this uh, list here from uh, Peter Burbach's paper from 2010. It's not really up, very up to date, but he describes the different gene families. I've also included David David, who often is called the father of neuropeptides, because he was one who advanced uh, studies, experimental studies in animals on the role of peptides in behavior. And actually his work was not very much appreciated, especially on the other side of the Atlantic. But uh, I think it turned out that much of what he did was quite advanced and behavior studies are not easy to reproduce unless you do it in the right way. So I think he deserves to be here. This little box uh, on the right hand side shows a paper, some papers where they have studied where actually did peptides first appear in the nervous system. And they uh, here say that it's in the jellyfish and there the neurotransmitters in that very simple nervous system were all peptides. No GABA, no glutamate, no monamines. And I think that gives some sort of historical perspective on the significance of neuropeptides, which not always have been so much appreciated. Now, um, here you see Victor in the middle, uh, in his little office. You know, at those days, when you visited a professor at Karolinska, you were first introduced to his secretary, who was sitting in the office outside the professor. You entered uh, the professor room, and after two minutes, the secretary came in with a tea and little cakes and so on but never Victor. This was such a narrow little room, so when Tamas and I, or Shel Fuchs and I were there, we could not sit side by side. I had to sit behind Shell, you know, to look over his shoulder to say hello to Victor. <laughs> 
So um, that is a special um, memory, of course. Victor was very special. There is no student to whom he lectured who has forgotten him. Why? Because he was so fascinating? No, because he wrote with his right hand the formulas, and in the second he wiped it out. So you really had to be alert, and you never forget that lecture, because if you weren't alert, you have lost your possibility to make the notes. I also worked together with Victor in the Nobel Committee for many years, and Victor was very special also there. Uh, as you probably know, the price is dependent on uh, the um, many, many evaluations before it is awarded by different people, and Victor made many such evaluations. The thing was, in those days, that you, these pages could, could be 30 pages, so it was quite very thorough, and no one made it th more thorough than Victor. And he also has this other little thing, because in those days you got paid for the number of pages from the Nobel Committee. <laughs> and so, of course, I didn't write very many, and, but it was to get many pages you introduced pictures, figures from the literature. <laughs> so in this way your honorarium increased, increased. But Victor, as a demonstration, I think, he never had any of that. He had single spaced, and he used all the page out to the edge to make a little a demonstration of that he thought how uh, um, evaluation should be. Now, Victor's peptides were not the first ones, as you may uh, imagine when you see this, that I worked with. Instead, it was substance P, which had a very long history at Karolinska because Ulf von Euler, Euler, the Nobel laureate, he discovered substance P when he was in UK working with Gadam in 1931. Then uh, Bengt Pano, who later became rector at Karolinska, uh, made his thesis with von Euler on substance P. But in 1971, Susan Lehman uh, discovered what actually substance P is, because up till when it was just a powder. And um, that started a whole new era where I was involved. And uh, because I got antibodies against these uh, peptides, and I could do immunohistochemistry. And the first tissue that I studied was uh, spinal cord because one had this idea that substance P is a transmitter in sensory neurons, perhaps a pain transmitter. And our work supported that really. And uh, we were very excited and one thought that if you just can get the substance P antagonist, you will solve the pain problems. Because substance P was acting in the dorsal horn and released from these sensory neurons. And a lot of things happened with substance P, as you see on the next slide. And uh, the, 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 the um, uh, receptors were found and cloned. And uh, one was looking for a substance P antagonist that would enter the brain, the spinal cord, and would block the pain signaling. But as you see here on the next slide, when it finally, such a compound was found in a drug company, uh, it didn't work. It didn't attenuate pain. So a big, really big disappointment, also for me, you know. And moreover, next step was that one could show that the substance P antagonist is efficient in, in, um, in, in, um, in depression. But again, when uh, that went to a bigger study, it also failed there. So there was really major disappointment also in the drug companies, and one started to doubt if neuropeptides are of interest at all. And there were many people who were critical, and that paper to the right here, you know, superfluous neurotransmitters. I mean, that was not nice. And Arvid Carlson, whom I admire, who didn't like neuropeptides, he got water on his uh, mill, you know, saying that neuropeptides. And Bowers, who wrote this, was not any type. He had been working in, 
in Coop first laboratory. And uh, so, you know, this was a big hit for me. Nevertheless, uh, we worked on neuropeptides and there were in the early phases many things we were wondering about. Because classically, uh, the peptide, the, the neurotransmitters are released from nerve endings uh, at the end of the action. Now, um, peptides, uh, because they can be produced in nerve endings, so that was not a major problem, but peptides, we thought, had to be produced in the cell bodies. And in the human body, nerves can be like a meter long from the hip to the toe. So if a peptide molecule is released from the nerve endings, it could take days until it can be replaced by new synthesis in the cell body and transport into the nerve endings. So then things happened that uh, kind of a little bit explained. Mike Ludwig, uh, he showed that peptides are released from dendrites. And of course, then the distance from synthesis to release is very short. So that's OK. And more recently, uh, Irene Schumann has shown that actually mRNA for the peptides is present in the nerve endings. So maybe there is a local synthesis of, 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 of peptides. So that kind of got rid of several of these questions over the years. Now, the perhaps most important finding we did was that neuropeptides are always present in the same neurons as also produce um, the classic transmitters like noradrenaline, like glutamate, and GABA, and so on and so on. But the first example was this noradrenaline somatostatin coexistence. And uh, thanks to my um, student, Jan Lundberg, who had a very successful, has had a very successful career. He became head of global research for AstraZeneca, and later on, Eli Lilly. So what we found in those days was that the peptides are different from the classic transmitters, also because of where they are stored. And I, don't can, I hope you can see that uh, on the top there to the left, peptides are stored in a special type of vesicle. So they are, have a different storage place from the classic transmitters like noradrenaline and GABA and glutamate and so on. And that also meant there is a possibility that peptides are, are released under different conditions. And what John could show in his thesis work was that actually only when neurons are firing at a high rate intensely, then peptides are released. And that's why, of course, if you look at a normal animal where nothing happens, if you knock out the peptide, you don't see anything because normally they are not at all uh, used. It's under certain conditions that peptides are coming into place. Now, all this work that we did in the early days uh, uh, led to an invitation to write a review in Nature. I was not so happy about that because I thought nature has such a lousy paper and they reproduce reference micrographs in a very bad way. So the editor had to remind me three times to Höckfeldt, are you going to write it or not? <laughs> Finally, we did it, fortunately, because this is my most cited paper ever. In any case, uh, 10 years later, I thought it's time to follow up to tell people what happened during the last 10 years. So in 1990, I, we, and I actually didn't ask, I just submitted the manuscript because I thought they were going to be so happy to accept this manuscript. Now what we wrote in that paper was, um, to the left here, in the 50s, if the 50s were the decade of acetylcholine, the 60s of catecholamines and serotonin, the 70s of GABA and glycines, we thought that the 80s would be the peptide decade. But, and then I, we wrote, unfortunately, instead, excitatory amino acid entered the scene and grabs the attention with their implications for learning and memory and for involvement in brain pathology. So after some time, we got um, a response from Nature. And here is what the editor wrote. First, the bad news. They cannot publish us. But then, here at the end, what I have said, instead, the excitatory amino acid entered the scene and grasped the attention. 
And then the other test, if contrary to expectation, excited amino acid really were the big thing in the 80s, I feel that the review article should focus on these more and less exclusively. <laughs> so that was a blow in the, in the head, yeah. Now, fortunately, the paper could be published then in Neuron, thanks to Eris Kandel, actually, he was very kind. So we could tell what happened during these 10 years. But this was also the time then when we turned to Victor's peptide, that is galanine. And uh, here's a summary of, of, of I, I, uh, you know, the various species, very similar. And there are also some new members of the galanine family now. But basically what we have done over the years is to study the role of galanine in, in pain signaling, depression, especially in relation to locus ceruleus, and also in the human brain. In, 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 um, you know, um, sometimes the important findings for yourself in any case are not the big important journals who publish that. This little paper uh, from 1987, uh, uh, this is the reason why we were interested in galanine and pain. And it was published in Neuroscience Letters, Impact Factor 2. Now, what happened there is shown here. What really att attracted our attention was that if we looked to the left on galanine in a normal dorsal root ganglion, that's uh, these cells which have substance P also that I told you. But if you cut the sciatic nerve, then you see to the right that at least half of all neurons suddenly produce high amounts of galanine. And we felt this must mean something. So this is what we have been working a lot on together, especially with Susanna wiesenfeld Halin. And uh, what we believe in brief is that Galanine is an endogenous analgesic. So when the nerve is damaged, it upregulates galanine as a protective mechanism against pain. At the same time, the two other peptides, sepsis and CGRP, which are excitatory and that produce pain, are downregulated. So, um, a little bit, and, and so that was, I think, the first time that one uh, sup, uh, proposed that there is an endogenous pain system in the dorsal root ganglia. As you see here, the, to the left down, the first endogenous anti nociceptive systems are the dorsal horn neurons, which produce encephaline. That was known since many years, but that the DRG neurons themselves, when they get wounded, when they get damaged, upregulates an anti nociceptive peptide. We think that could be misported. So that opened up for ideas about treatment and so on. And there was confusing evidence that galanine also actually induced pain. That was solved by a, a Chinese. Um, uh, guest scientist, uh, Ruby, to the right up. Uh, because what she could show was that actually this pronociceptive of effect of galanine, which occurs in the beginning, that is causing pain, uh, is exerted via one of the three receptors, galar 3 Whereas the second, and what I've been talking about, the anti nociceptive effect was associated with Galar 1, which was present in interneurons in the dorsal horn. Now, of course, if you talk about treatment, you would like really to be able to know what is in the human ganglia and the human spinal cord, because we treat humans and not rats. So, um, I have checked two recent papers uh, in the literature, one from Price and one from Patrick Anfors at Karolinska, and they have completely different um, results from the single cell analysis. So the first study can only demonstrate Galar 3 
in human dorsal ganglia. The second one can show galanine, but not any of the receptors. And that reminded me of some results that my student, my, my postdoc a student, found many years ago. She came to me with this uh, fi figure showing that virtually every cell in dorsal ganglia has DRG, has galanine R3. And that's confirmed with some, some, some um, uh, QPCR. So I don't know. Uh, in any case, our hypothesis about GALAR1 and GALAR2 seems pretty shaky as it is now. And uh, if we want to really go through, we have to solve the problem, which is the receptor that is important. So um, now we go to major depression. Um, is this 40 minutes? Did I speak 40 minutes already? No, okay, I see 40 minutes here. So uh, now we turn to depression and we have a group, I, I'm not explaining what depression is, I think everyone knows a bit about that. Here is the people who have worked with uh, us on, on, on depression. And the reason we became interested was the finding by Tourmelander in his thesis that the locus ceruleus neurons have galanine, as you can see here to the left, to the, here that uh, galanine is green, tyrosine hydroxylase is red, and that virtually every galanine positive cell is a noradrenergic cell. And Vicky Hollitz followed up, and uh, she could also show that NPY, Victor's other peptides, again is present in population of dorsal root ganglion neurons, but not as many as uh, uh, for galanine. So we did electrophysiology, and uh, I'm just going to focus on the upper left corner. And this was actually has been shown before by other groups, but what is clear is that galanine inhibits the spontaneous firing of um, this locus ceruleus, not another locus ceruleus neurons. If we put on a gala two or three agonists, nothing happened. So it seemed to be something to have to do with, um, with the GALAR1. Now, many groups have uh, worked on this issue on, on depression and galanin. I've listed them, Tamash, Ulu, and so on. So, so we, but, but in conclusion, what we have thought based on rat experiments is that galanin inhibits firing of noradrenergic neurons possibly after release from dendrites, as I said, we know may occur. And this is some sort of emergency break. So when the noradrenaline neurons fire too much, galanin is created, dampens the activity. However, it's um, not as simple as that. So if, if this is true, then GALAR1 is pro-depressive, and Thomas has provided good evidence that GALAR2 is the opposite, antidepressive. So in any case, one can suggest uh, agonist, antagonist, and so on to treat uh, depression. More recently, many studies, many groups have been, become interested in locus ceruleus. And actually, they have told Thomas Huckfeldt that he is wrong. So we thought that we have to redo some experiments. Everything else so far was galanin, and now we have done uh, work on the mouse locus ceruleus. And uh, here you see Martino Carami, you know, the, the Caramia, the, the, the Italian uh, postdoc, and uh, Roman Romanov and Tibor Harkin have been working on this. And uh, you can see that uh, here that tyrosine hydroxylase is green, galanin is red, just as in rat. So almost all. Uh, locus ceruleus are galanin positive. But in contrast to rat, no NPY is present. But also, if you look up in the left right corner, you see that what galanin does is to um, reduce firing. So that is similar in mouse and rat. What we did further was what Tibor 
did further, further was to also do single cell analysis of locus ceruleus. And uh, I'm not going into the details here. Uh, you can see here on the next slide what it looks like when you do in situ hybridization. And you can see that um, uh, the cells have, for example, gastrin release in peptide. They have a caught peptide. But what surprised us was actually that there are so many peptides in the locus ceruleus. We have been talking about galanin and NPY for 20, 30 years, and now you can see that there are so many more peptides and so many more peptide receptors than we thought. So we are wondering, have you been climbing up the wrong tree? Maybe there is some peptide that is much more interesting than galanin and NPY. I hope also for Victor that galanin and NPY still are interesting. We will see. Again, um, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. No, no, I'm, again, uh, as said, for the peptides, for the pain studies, the real interesting thing is what happens in the human brain. So we have a group that has been working on on um, the human brain and um, locus ceruleus, especially. Uh, and uh, here you see what locus ceruleus looks like. You can see two dark dots a bit above the arrows. You can see the locus ceruleus by your eye because it has so much pigment that it is black. So that is not no difficulty to, to... And this nucleus project all over the brain, also to the spinal cord. Now I want really to show this slide here, or, or two slides using another technique, not immunohistochemistry, but using a new type of microscope, which is a light sheet microscope, where you can show the whole three-dimensional uh, uh, extent of a nucleus with immunohistochemistry. And this work has been done by Shaba Dori from Hungary. It's a fantastic work that he's done virtually alone. But of course, there are 15 authors on the paper, <laughs> as usual nowadays, too. In any case, uh, you see that the upper row, the three upper panel, is from a normal brain stained for tyrosine hydroxylase. The lower panel is from an Alzheimer brain stained for tau, this protein that is increasing in the Alzheimer brain. Now, I just have taken the two high power magnifications here. And you see a buff, healthy neurodenergic neurons stained with tyrosine hydroxylase. And this, in red, you see how lousy the neurons look when you have Alzheimer. This is about the same magnification. What remains of these wonderful, beautiful, grayish neurons are some, de some, some de debris of neurons, you know. So you understand that you're not well, in any case, uh, this, we, we had planned to do this on, on, on depressed patients and so on, but all this has disappeared because Shabba has left and so on, so this we cannot do. In any case, what we really started with was just to do simple in seed hybridization on the locus ceruleus, human locus ceruleus, and we could confirm that in the middle, too, that galan is produced there, and we also saw galan 3 uh, with our probes. Again, we recently have had possibilities to look at single cell uh, analysis of um, the locus ceruleus, thanks to Eva Hedlund, who is working on ALS, uh, disease, on ALS disease. And here you can see again what an enormous number of peptides uh, are expressed in the human locus ceruleus. You see, 56 peptides were detected. <laughs> and what was very interesting was the box here in red, where you see that also some of these neurons have glutamate. So they are not only neurodenergic, peptidergic, but also glutamatergic. We have also looked at the human frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, which is, of course, a region of major importance in the human brain for decision, for 
for, 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 for you, for, for emotions and so on. This was thanks to two persons, especially Miki Palkowitz in Budapest, who has a brain bank, who is the master of micro dissections of brain. What he has done is he has micro dissected 17 subregions of the prefrontal cortex. And thanks to Matthias Ullin, uh, who paid for this big study, it's not a single cell study, it's a bulk study. But in any case, we have, as you see on the next slide, uh, you see we have so much data here, you, you just cannot think about it. When Song and Swapnale Birds, uh, Birds were the people who worked on that. But I want to take out three things from this study. First, that with bulk studies, compared to single cell studies, we see more peptides than uh, with our approach. Then I want to just show you some in seed hybridization on the distributional peptides, and then I want to show you some evidence that peripheral peptides produced in fat cells and uh, intestine, that they can have an effect in the brain. So here is an example, adrenomedullin, which is a, a plenty of peptides and which we have seen in here, the lower left here, uh, adrenomedullin. But in the single cell analysis reference, they don't detect that. And all these neuropeptides, they cannot detect uh, with single cell. Same thing with, with, with receptors. So, I mean, I'm saying this because our paper was rejected in three journals because it, we didn't use single cell. So they kind of failed to appreciate that there's some advantages with this bulk, not single cell, namely that we have a higher sensitivity. We have done then in situ hybridization, and you can easily see here that um, one of the most, uh, that is the most uh, important and abundant peptide in cortex is Victor Mutz cholecystokinin. You see uh, the dense here network. And actually, when we double stain for glutamate and GABA, it turns out that many of the neurons are glutamatergic pyramidal neurons, but also some are GABAergic. I, I, I skip the, the high power magnification here. We also could actually demonstrate galanin and galanin peptides uh, receptor transcripts. And as you see here, the galanin is coexisting with VGLUT1, that is a glutamatergic neuron, and in, in some with, uh, with galanin, galar1, and galar3. They all can be detected in human cortex and they coexist with glutamate or GABA, especially glutamate. Now, this was a bit surprise for me, because when we look at the rat brain, uh, galanin can hardly be detected. So we believe that maybe galanin is more important in human cortex, in human brain, than in the uh, rat brain. We can also construct, as seen here, some uh, circuit, microcircuitry, which I'm not going into. And then the third thing I wanted to demonstrate here is that Peptides are produced in cells, in the intestine, in fat, the most important one, perhaps leptin, and, but also adiponectin is another fat peptide. Now, when we look in the prefrontal cortex for receptors and peptides, what we find are very high levels of, adip of the adiponectin one receptor, but we don't find adiponectin itself. So what are all these receptors doing? Much more, much higher than the CCK receptors, which is the main peptide in the brain. Is it really true that they can be transported from the blood, past the blood-brain barrier, and have an effect in the prefrontal cortex? We, we cannot have any other explanation than that's the case. Since the receptors for peptides are so sensitive, they only need nanomolar concentrations. It's possible that even if one or two percent of the peptide pass the blood-brain 
barrier, that may be of functional significance for our activity in the prefrontal cortex. So finally, I want to say, uh, show you some results from um, studies on post-mortem brains from depressed patients, that is, patients that have committed suicide. And there we have looked uh, uh, on different regions, prefrontal cortex, locus ceruleus, and so on. And this is thanks to Nagib Meshavar, who has a brain bank in Canada, and the person who did this work is Swapnali Bard. Uh, I'm just showing uh, this slide. And what you see here, basically, if we look to the left, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, you see arrows and you see uh, the various peptide substances, P receptors and PY receptors, galanin receptors. And you can see that um, they are increased mostly. So there are differences in expression in the depressed brains versus controlled brains. And interestingly, when we measured DNA methylation, if you look at the left panel again, in the left box, I have a thick, uh, big, upregulated peptide for the methylated, for galanin. And this is what we expect, that when, um, when there is the, the methylation goes up, then um, the levels go down in that particular case. So we, we, in any case, the message, home message, take home message is that in the human brain, there are uh, in depressed patients, changes in levels of peptide and peptide receptors. We have even been able to do a genetic study when we had a, a grant from a European, New Mood. And um, the conclusion from that is that the galanin, I read here, system plays a significant role in the pathogenesis of depression, almost entirely by modulating the vulnerability to early and recent psychosocial stress, possibly involving all three uh, galanin receptors. Again, this paper was studied, was thanks to your Hungarian, especially Hungarian collaborators, Gabriela Juhas and Georgi Bagdi. And this just uh, is a little bit summary of, of um, the, the um, genetic results. So uh, if I may summarize, and now I'm almost at the end, some conclusion regarding galanin and depression. Uh, the top here is saying that galanin in anterior cingulate cortex counteracts excessive glutamate release. So here we have a situation where galanin and glutamate coexist, but the coexisting molecules are antagonistic. It's actually the same in noradrenaline neurons, that uh, galanin and noradrenaline are antagonistic. But now we also know that in the human brain they are glutamatergic. Why is this interesting? Because um, the most recent treatment of depression is with the drug ketamine, which is a glutamate antagonist. So this means, and, and all focus has been on glutamate ketamine in the forebrain for treatment. That's why the effect is. But now that also the locus ceruleus neurons may be um, glutamatergic, maybe ketamine has another target in the lower brainstem. And now I'm almost at the end. Because I want to say that even if the journey with peptides has been a tough journey because there has been so much resistance and people have not been thinking that peptides have any, are of any significance, there are now still several drugs on the market, FDA approved. And these are the ones I have listed here. The most important and interesting one, I think, are the anti-CGRP antibodies or CGRP antagonists. CGRP is a peptide that is present in many dorsal root ganglion neurons together with substance P. And now these antibodies are used for treatment of galanin or these antagonists. This is a major uh, 
um, step forward for migraine patients, which is a disease that many, many people suffer. The other drug on the market is uh, orexin hypocretin antagonists, which are used for treatment of insomnia. And uh, it so turned out that the NK1 antagonist that was not efficient in depression actually counteracts emesis. And so that is sold on the market also. And there are actually even more things coming up on the horizon. Uh, for example, here I have list three papers where they say that these orexin hypocretin antagonists that are good for uh, insomnia, helps you to fall asleep, they may have something good in the treatment of narcolepsy, in Alzheimer's disease, and in epilepsy. We never know. So I think that now we see the beginning of a new era, maybe the 2020s are the uh, decennium, decade of the peptides, neuropeptides. So, in any case, uh, when we started, um, we, we had the situation with the wheel, which was incomplete. I was close to breakthrough when the grant money ran out, which happened to many people working on the galanine, actually. I have several colleagues who have told me they cannot work on galanine because they don't get any more money for galanine research. So nowadays it looks a little bit better. It's not full the wheel, but still it's uh, quite a bit on the way. Of course, I have had over the years many collaborators. I mean, I, I just cannot count them. And um, this photo was from uh, maybe 20 years ago when I had a big group. Nowadays, it, it over the years, uh, got um, smaller and smaller and very small. But as I told you, I'm working with uh, very powerful people like Tibor, um, Tibor Tarkani and Matthias Ullén, and I always get good advice uh, from Thomas Bartfeil. He has over the years been so helpful and actually suggested many changes in the di direction of, of my, my, my or our research. So um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you and for inviting. Yeah, yeah, okay. so, sorry. so thank you very much for this um, fantastic lecture. We have time for questions, so if uh, there are some. Yeah, Mart. So <clears throat> there have been thank you. There have been a couple of interesting papers showing that galanine inhibits tyrosine hydroxylase in, uh, in nigral dopamine neurons. Uh, wh what do you think about this data? Okay, I, I stand here instead, yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, this is not my field, and uh, I think you should ask Tamas what he thinks about it. But, um, you know, I mean, the, the, these peptides, they do almost everything. If you just look careful and long enough, you will find things. Tamash, maybe, do you want to respond? So, so the, the enzyme SFRI studies in which you would look for a classical inhibitor of an enzyme in, uh, are, are very inconclusive. You would not use an inhibitor which have so low KI value. Okay. It is in 10 micromolar to 0 0.1 micromolar, yeah. very large Not variability. Um, the ones which Thomas mentioned go the direction that in some cells expressing galanine receptor, uh, tyrosine hydroxylase expression is reduced, and therefore tyrosine hydroxylase activity is reduced. But that's at a cellular level, and what the circuitry is, Different. If you ask straight out, is it is like 
Tripsin and tripsin inhibitor, no. <laughs> but I mean, since the tyrosine hydroxylase protein levels are very high in neurons, in the same neurons, it's an extracellular enzyme, extravesicular uh, cytoplasmic enzyme, sorry. So, you know, why not? Non micromolar is <laughs> not an impressive Oh. One more. I have one question. How many neuroceptors are there? What would you say today? Well, I, I, I would say, why, why not 200? <laughs> Do we have evidence? I wouldn't be. If, if Victor has discovered 50, and if, uh, uh, you know, if you go to some other of the big labs that discovered many things, like in Italy, uh, then of course uh, they're, they're, they can add it easily 50 more. And, and then if you have break prone products and then active fragments and so on, so on, so on. So, so I mean, I think it's really not such an interesting question. It's, uh, there are enough. <laughs> You know, if, if you twist the question as pharma does, how many drug targets are related to neuropeptides, then the estimate is somewhere around 500 to 1,000. Because just think of galanin having three receptor subtypes clearly, NPY having five already identified. So not only are the peptides themselves have pharmacological effects, but they are different at different receptor subtypes. So as for noradrenaline, you would not want to give somebody an alpha-2 agonist who needs a beta-1 antagonist and so So the number of drug targets, we are talking of close to a thousand. And this does not include the peptidase inhibitors, of which some, like Januvia, a trivial depeptide for inhibitor is selling for $1.2 billion, which I don't care very much about. What I care about that it is the most common type 2 diabetes drug right now. More common than any other. So more questions? Then I take uh, freedom and ask one. Normally for receptors there are agonists and antagonists. Is there some kind of uh, clarity what type of peptides can be agonists and what type of peptides can be antagonists? Well, I, I, th I, I think that there is, um, anyone can be both, you know, I mean, it's, uh, that's my feeling. And um, I mean, what, what, what was the big thing is, if you talk about treatment, as I see it, is if you, if the correct treatment is an antagonist, that's a much better situation than if you need to develop an agonist. For example, the, the John Yu spent years to develop a small molecule CCK agonist to treat food uh, intake, you know, and uh, they didn't succeed really. To, to And then, of course, you have the morphine situation that agonist if it passes the blood-brain barrier, we reach all receptors in the whole nervous system. And of course, the galanin receptors are everywhere. So then you, just as for morphine, the, you know, you can have a lot of side effects. So, um, so that's what worries me, that for treatment of pain at the spinal level, you need a GALAR1 agonist. Of course, if, uh, so, so I mean, we're still working with it to see uh, about galanin and NPY and pain and so on. Uh, if, uh, I mean, if people really have a lot of pain, it's relevant to do intrathecal injections in just at, at the spinal cord level, of course. Mm -hmm. If you get an effect that lasts for longer than three, four, five hours, then you have a different situation. And uh, but of course, still, if you can administer peripherally, then, of course, it's, it's very much easier, everything. On the other hand, maybe you have a lot of side effects. But, I mean, I have always had this feeling that 
It is only when systems are disturbed that they are um, available for, th uh, for therapeutic attacks, so to say, you know. If there's no, if they norm work normally, then there's no, not so much to do, so, so I don't know. No, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, once more.